second. Let me know if you guys can see it. Yes. Okay, amazing. Okay. So here we are. So thank you everybody for assist. Today we'll talk about measuring and communicating product success. And it's my favorite topic. Well, I'll tell you what is my favorite topic. And it's today's, I think, one of the most controversial parts in product. Uh, and so when I say in product is overall the product teams, right? And today I will try to demystify some of these uh, concepts. And also I'll try to give you some tools that you can use after this conversation in your company. And hopefully this will help your career. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Jesus Cajide. I am a senior product manager in PayPal. But let me tell you a little bit about my career, how I arrived here. Uh, until today, I've been spending the last 12 years uh, of my career working in digital products. I just started as a founder. I'm from Mexico. So I started founding two companies in Mexico. Uh, I have one failed company, like every startup, and I learn a lot. And I have a successful exit. My company was acquired in 2013. We were creating financial products for the Latin American market. And that bring me here to Silicon Valley. Uh, until that moment, I, I spent now seven years officially as a product manager. And it's been a journey. Over that time, I spent most of my career in FinTech, creating products for business to customer and business to business, helping them to improve their finances, so helping them to access to money in, where, in places where they cannot find money. In this case, like people who don't have a bank account, so who don't have access to ATMs. And also I spent some part of my career in analytics, trying to understand patterns of bad people trying to steal money for other bad people. And when I'm talking about this is cyber crime, right? And fraud. So I spent some part of my career in that part too. Now with all these years of experience, uh, I, I get to work in different spectrum of the product. I work with a uh, my sales teams to bring this to more customers, but in the same time, I, I work with my customer service team to understand where were the pain for our, our products. Unfortunately, in my career, I had the opportunity to not only conceptualize product, but launch in new markets and maintain it. And nowadays in PayPal, I am a product manager in the credit area. And my principal responsibility is growth products in the European market. Now, over all these years, one of the constant questions that I need to resolve over the organization, not only my team, but over the organization, you can imagine that this change when you are a startup of five people, and it's different when you're a company of more than 22,000 people. The principal question that everybody should answer before create or try to grow a product is, what is this product success? What does it mean? How it started? And most important, how we communicate it, right? Because remember, it's not about numbers. This is about people. Products and companies are made by people for people. So it doesn't matter how much number we have, really doesn't matter how much we can actually put in the spreadsheets and put PowerPoints. If the people who we work in on, like they don't understand what that means and where we're going, right? And this will be the beginning of this conversation. First we need to clarify what is product. And I like to simplify the term to be in the same page. A digital product, and then it's a tool, and as simple as that. And we have tools every day for resolve activities online and offline. So let's think about this. When you guys are, are using Spotify, you are using the for listening music. When you guys are using Amazon e-commerce, you're using to buy physical goods. When you're using Amazon Prime Video, you're using for watch movies, or in the case, Netflix. But in the same time, you used to use the cable and the TV to do the same. Or in the past, you used to use Walmart or radio or YouTube to exactly accomplish the same activity. So I want that you guys think about this. Every product, digital or non-digital, is a tool. And that tool will help in us to resolve some activities or some tasks in our life. Now, a product have two responsibilities. The first responsibility is finish the task and help the person to arrive to a value, right? We need to help them to get the value after they finish that activity, right? And the second is we actually have the responsibility to, to make this 
profitable because as I mentioned before, the company is made by and created by people. So we need people to continue growing the company. Unfortunately, we don't have enough cyborgs yet to just have the company with cyborgs. And even so, we need money to keep the cyborgs going on. So we need to generate some profit. And that's the goal. And I want to demystify one part here. You can ask me, hey, Jesus, but what are you talking about profitability? And we know that it's, it's a long journey. The companies are not profitable one day to another. And that's true. The companies are not profitable one day to another. But those it means that that's not our target, right? As a product people, I'm talking about engineer managers, product managers, UX managers, marketing, business, all the team who is creating the product, all responsibilities try to target to a profitability path, right? So with that in hand, so what are then what means product success? Well, product success then is something very simple. If the people is using our tool and they embed it in their day-to-day -day life, so we'll have a retained customer base. The people will adopt it in their life. So we have a group of customers who will use in this again and again, right? And that happens, we'll have more possibilities to actually achieve profit. We'll have more customers who want to pay. And I want to break here one, one dilemma that people normally have, like, hey, so you're talking about all these people will they generate this money? But no, the products are, are charging money. That's true. But people always pay. People paying us with money, people paying us with time, but people paying us with effort. Customers always pay to use a tool. And it's in our team, right? And in our business model, the responsibility of how we will transform what they're paying us to money to generate profit, right? And well, I will talk more about, about this. Unfortunately, in this class, we, were, we are not going to all the deep dives of what is a monetization model, but I will touch part of this and we can talk in another opportunity, another talks about what is a monetization model, right? Now, with this in mind, if, you, if I say we have a retaining customers and the retaining customers will use my product, I wonder you keep in mind one thing. As today, the most difficult thing is keep the customers. People have so many tools in day-to-day -to -day life. We have so many choices and this is not something new. With the concept of technology, remember technology is an accelerator. With the concept of technology or the facility to get more tools, it's easy for us to change to tool A to tool B. So as today, the most costly and more difficult is to retain customers or to make these customers as part of their life, like probably need to be part of his life. Before we even think about product, uh, one thing I see again and again that product teams forget is like we need to understand what is the business model of the company, right? If we don't understand the business model of the company, we cannot create products or we cannot improve the product. And a business model is a system. It's a system that is interrelated. And I know that as today, we, we have our different ways to visualize what is a business model. I think the, the most famous is a business canvas model by Strategizer. I see, unfortunately, that most of the people feel that feel the canvas wrong, and it's not their fault. <laughs> it's unfortunately they feel like wrong because there are many topics in that business canvas model that people who is feeling that don't have the background, right? So I want to simplify that view for you guys and put the three different pillars of fundamental parts that I believe a business model should contains, and you can communicate with your team. The first part of the business model that you also need to keep in mind is what is the audience? Who is this customer? And what is the value these people is looking for? The second thing that you guys need to keep in mind is what are the steps and the process that is involved to deliver this value? So how people will know about this, how people will take it, how people will consume it, right? And from what they're consuming, what is the thing behind it? Think about this as simple as go to a supermarket. How do you guys know that is Sam's Club? You guys probably hear about Sam's Club. And after you will go to Sam's Club, there will be a physical store. And the Sam's Club, you will get your goods and you will pay with a cashier and you will get your goods. However, to Sam's Club to, to bring you as a customer, this entire number of steps need to be awareness, they need to be a retail, they need to be some providers. All the activities that are involved to that person get the goods from Sam's Club is what we call the value change, right? And the third part is a profit mechanism, right? 
I probably have multiple ways to make money, right? And also to consume money, the, the cost. So we need to understand that. Thinking that in mind, these three components will tell us how or how we can actually perceive a product offering and how the product offering will be evolving. And we will measure it, right, by performance. So we want to understand the product performance, how often, right, and how many people are receiving value. In the customer value chain, we will understand how the product will be available or what is the lane that the customer can get the product. And this, in this part of product health, we normally will see all the funnels, right? Or all the different SLAs or infrastructure or whatever all the steps that we need to optimize to make the people get to the value. But it's not the value. It's just how people will arrive to the value, the process that involve it to arrive to the value, right? Funnels about how we are acquiring customers, funnels about how people is behaving to arrive to the value, funnels to understand how we can bring the customers back. And profit mechanisms will evaluate the way that we are making money, right? How people is paying us and how often they are paying us. And I want to put an example here to illustrate this, this business model. When we think about Amazon Prime Video, which is one of my, my favorite uh, ways of monetization, these guys, you think about this, they are a streaming platform. Amazon Prime Video is a streaming platform that allow you to see videos on demand, right? And this could be TV shows or it could be movies. They have very well established that they are a distributor and a distributor, they have a group of activities. However, when we think about the monetization models that Amazon Prime Video have, we can think first one is if you have Amazon Prime, right? We can attribute that you actually pay the Amazon subscription annually. And for that subscription, we need to understand how many people is watching the videos. Second is by transaction. By in Amazon Prime Video, you can also rent movies or you can buy movies, right? Or TV shows, it's one-time transaction. And the third one, which is uh, right now tested in the United States is by advertisement. Now that you can also watch movies and that movies will be free for the final customer, but they will include advertisement. So we can see here how one product will have three different monetization models. And let's try to go deeper in this, in this conversation. So I think what is profit? Like, how, how we know that we are actually going to a profitable way, yes or not. And you probably will sit down with your, your executives and normally you will define business goals. Well, profit then is, is the result of the revenue minus the cost, but this will be affected by the market and the environment. Normally people just think about, okay, we, we sell more and we sell more and actually meanwhile, we can cover our costs, everything go well. But unfortunately, it's not true. We need to consider that what is the market? Like what is the potential size of the market, right? What actually are the regulations in that territory? How much people is willing to pay? And the other thing that will affect us is environment. How many competitors we have there? And if we have the enough suppliers to actually to make our life easier to arrive the product, right? These are components that we need to consider in our strategy. Now, Going a little more forward, when people think about profit, and this probably you will hear about this in your meetings, if we just are going to set up success by profit, you guys will have two ways, super easy. And this is coming from the financial teams. You can increase your revenue or you can decrease your cost. So we fire everybody in the company and we will decrease the cost soon enough. Or we go and remove all the operations and we can remove the cost, right? And that will help in the, with the profit we have as established your profit. But that's not a solution, right? And the solution for actually to, to make a product successful is not just increase the sales. Right? When we talk about increase the sales and this is when I think start to get a mix up, we'll hear these concepts. Okay, we need to increase the sales and we have two, two ways. Or we actually try to increase the sales in our existing customers or we try to get new customers. But for getting new customers, we can probably enter in new markets or we can create new futures or new products, right? That support new customer base or try to penetrate a specific market. Or we actually will expand in distribution channels. So for be only in mobile to be web or to be, for example, in Amazon Alexa. That's for the new. And for the existing, normally we'll go to try to people buy more often or try to increase the price. And this, when we, when we talk about you guys blog and internet, 
you will see the, met the typical metrics. We acquire more customers or we engage more customers, right? That's, that's normally the result of an executive meeting about how we actually will go about, how we actually make more money. Is that the correct view? Not all. Like we actually, it's part of the view. That's only one part of the product. Remember, a product has two responsibilities. We need to give value and we need to make profit, right? And the two things are interconnected. The more value that we give, the more customers that we have, the more opportunities we have to actually to monetize. And it's when the things start to make sense, how, how we can consolidate this view, right? So we normally establish some strategic intents by market. This view that I show you here, that possible tree of decision about how we'll acquire more customers or how we'll actually try to engage more of the existing customers, right? At the end, we need to put everything in the same flag. We need to tell our team, okay, in this to, to achieve our financial goals or to achieve or business goals, we will enter in this new market. So we are developing the market. We are in this existing market and we need to bring more customers. So we actually bring in this new feature, which will penetrate the market. Penetration is about take the same product and bring more customers with a new future. Or we'll expand the market, meaning we take our market share and we'll increase the market share, the same product, more customers. Or we are trying to expand our offering, which probably will go to a different vertical. Or not everything is just about expand or take more part of the pie. In so many times, we also need to defend our market. So that means like we actually are really established in one market and we detect that somebody else come to try to, to take some part of our pie. So we need to defend that. And we, how we know that we're defended? because we have a group of customers that are already using us and suddenly we see a drop of these customers. You can ask me, Jesus, this sounds nice and dandy. This sounds like a, a perfect executive meeting agenda, but how we make something relevant from them? Well, luckily today I will teach you some frameworks to you can translate all these fancy words in something actionable for your company, right? First, to our right to all this, when, if we want to develop markets, penetrate, expand, or defend, we need to come back to the basis. We need to answer, ask ourselves, what is the value? Why people will use my product, right? Why are people are using my family of products? That normally we'll, we'll find it if we, we have a clear product mission that will be there. If not, we need to detect what is what people is using us and in which moment, which activity is actually releasing the value. I will put some examples in that. The second thing is we need to understand how many retaining customers do we have, right? Once that we understand what is value, we need to understand how many of them they're still using us and for how long time that will be the retention curve. And how we know that? Well, we need to identify what is this interaction which is releasing the value and see in daily, weekly, or monthly basis, depending on the frequency of our product, how people is using us. And I will arrive to that part of how we detect what is monthly, what is weekly, what is, not everybody need to measure weekly or daily, right? That's a myth. Every product or every tool have its own cadence, right? Have its own pace. This, this is the typical, the typical analogy of trying to use a, a hammer for everything. You, you cannot use hammer for everything. And we cannot force people to use hammer for everything. People have different tools and they're using the tools in different frequency. And the third, to arrive to this part of the profit and establish a good strategies, we need to understand where are we in this market? Like the financial goals that we are established over that specific market, are we really able to accomplish them or not? And that will be if we can measure where is the product life cycle stage. Right? And we'll talk about what is a product life cycle stage. Let's go first with uh, what is value? So the value, right, is the result of what a market, specific segment of the market, is trying to accomplish. And when I say that is, remember, people don't buy stuff, right? They buy what the stuff does for them. And I'm taking, I'm rescuing this phrase from Jobs to be Done, which is a, one of the frameworks that in early my career that helped me to, to define my mental models. And everything that we'll see today, I won't say that is 100% job to be done, 
but most of my philosophy are based on jobs to be done by all week, right? Now, when we think about products, as I mentioned, people is looking to achieve a specific value and we can actually divide the value in something very simple. I like to, I like to show this to my teams to show them like, it's, it's as easy as that, how we will transform something that looks very bizarre, very complicated, very blurry in something that we can quantify. So normally when people use products, they're looking for emotional values or for functional values. When we're talking about functional values is, is something that they help them over their life, right? They could be making more money or saving money or they can be saving time, right? But people is also looking for receive some emotional values. Could be receiving some personal emotions, right? Like feel more secure or confident or feel trust when they are realizing certain actions or social like recognition and belonging. Let's go deep in some examples. Like when we think about people learning new skills, and I'm here not, not mentioning the solution. The solution of learning your skills could be a class, and that class could be in a formal university, or could be something more like online, like LinkedIn learning. That's the solution, that's the tool. But what actually people are trying to here do is to learn a new skill. What is the result of learning a new skill, right? And here's when we will start to separate the markets. One part of the market probably are looking for get a promotion, and that promotion will help them to make more money. Other part of the market who are actually looking for get more self-validation. They want to learn, have some self-validation that eventually help them with a promotion and of course help them to make more money. Or one part of the market could actually help them to get more confident of what they're doing, right? So we need to understand what is at the end the value that that people is looking for. Another example is insurance. When you guys get insurance, you're actually getting peace of mind. Insurance is not a product that you guys will check every single day. You know, unless it's not common that people is constantly open their phone or a browser checking how the insurance is going or my insurance is changing or my insurance is not changing. Insurance probably will be a product that you will review or, or hopefully you never review, right? Because you don't need it. But the value that you are receiving for getting insurance is peace of mind, right? And the feeling of saving money because what insurance is communicating to you is Whatever happens, we will cover you. If you don't have enough, you probably will get in trouble and they will actually will make more money. Right? That's typical products that people are not using. And what I want to mention this is because we cannot go there and try to sell more people insurance to be sure that like, they are using our product, or we cannot force them to, to check their phone 20 times a day how the insurance is going to justify engagement. And I see this in a lot of product teams that are trying to do this, send more notifications, send more alerts, try to make the people come to the to application and they see more the application is not. We cannot force the things. Remember the tool have a goal and that goal will release a value. And let's talk about something more um, polemical like social applications. And then social applications that are helping us to, to maintain contact with somebody else. So every time that you guys receive a like or receive a I like in your publication, post, picture, and you name it. Could be in Reddit, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever post, right? When you're posting, it's not the actually the, the power of the receiving the value. When you are receiving the like and you actually see the like and you actually reply to establish a communication with a person is when you're receiving the value. What is the value they're receiving there? Fully not belonging, probably confidence or recognition, right? If somebody, for example, posted and nobody, nobody liked me, nobody do the likes and nobody reshare, what happened there? Are, are the person receiving value? No, it's, it's only one way. Why? Because actually the principal purpose of social networks is connect people. And I want to make that clear because that's in the mission of the company. Normally, every time that you guys see the product mission, check what is the product mission of the entire company. In the case of Facebook, right? is connecting people. And that was until 2019. And in 2018, they changed it to not only connecting people, but bringing people closer together to make meaningful relationships. And you can see a big switch in what, people, what Facebook was doing. Instead to continue expanding and try to people get more friends and try to post in more, they changed the products to actually to create communities, groups, rooms, events, like how actually make sure that these people is having relationships and that relationship will go for longer. Okay, now 
let's put this in, in a more simple way. So let's say that, let's put the philosophy that heights. Okay, we understand that is value. We understand that people is looking for, for a value when you're using a product. How we know, how we can measure Jesus. What is, what is the event? But you guys need to understand your customers and your customer will have multiple steps using your product. Right? We have some products for being to business that will require more steps to arrive to the value. Let's take, for instance, uh, tools like Mixpanel or like Amplitude or whatever analytical tool that for actually to receive the value, what is the value of all these tools? Analytical tools helping us to take decisions. When is the moment that people is taking decisions when they see dashboards and they can act over the dashboards, right? So to arrive to that part, people probably first need to understand this, the developers need to take the ZK, they need to instrument the ZK in all the product, let the information need to put, put it in dashboards. And after somebody need to see these dashboards, find value in the dashboards, take decisions and probably modify the dashboards. So when is the, the value received? When people is using dashboards, people is creating that, modifying that, and creating more dashboards and collaborate with other people, right? The same thing happens with everything else when we think about product. We can, we can separate it in a very simple four layers that I put it here, guys. One is we need to understand that our product will be used by multiple segments, right? But it doesn't matter the segment. The real thing that matters is that segment, how will you use our value? Like for example, Spotify, we can actually create thousands of personas. Yes, they will help us to understand better who is the person. Music lovers, like Spot, uh, in this case, people who are studying music, we can say uh, melancholic, romantic people. And then what is the real goal of, of Spotify? It's a distributor that's helping to listen music. Why? Because people want to write to emotion. You listen music to receive emotions. And it's something that people did before Spotify. We have radios, Wildman, and so on, people, music in life. So the real action that we need to be sure is when is people listen music? Now, you can create your personas based on the context. Yes, we have different number of engagement based on people studying, on people trying to go to a party, or people trying to drive and concentrate or listen to a podcast. That's what the content will tell us, but their value is released in one action. Listen music. I'm here I'm to clarify. It's not when people is clicking in the play. It will actually listen to music. Clicking in the play doesn't do anything, right? A bot can do that. But how we, are, how we can know that the value is released when people is playing music and really listen to music. So it's certain threshold of music listened by the people, right? And how people do that, we actually need to measure the frequency. Now, frequency, as I mentioned, is not something that you guys will invent. I wonder if you guys think out of the box. Normally, when you think in your product, we get biases by the actions in our product or what actually we believe our product should be. Every time that you say, what is the value exchange interaction and what is the context, see around and see how the people is trying to do the exactly the same activity and the context and how often they do that, right? They could be daily, they could be weekly, they could be monthly. For example, people used to read newspaper and they used to read every day to keep informed. Later, the newspaper was substituted by the TV and people used to watch news every single day in the TV. And now people is continue watching news now in Facebook, in the news feed. It's the same activity changes by technology, but they have a cadence and the cadence is a frequency. Think about that. The principal competitor of your product is not the people who have the same technology that you. It is the product who do exactly the same activity that you. I don't necessarily need to be online, could be totally offline. And I put some examples here. Think about somebody who is uh, trying to listen music, right? Or people who try to go to a point A to point B, or people who are getting the groceries and the context can change, right? I can actually go to, to a destination. I hope so I can do it by teletransportation, but I cannot do it yet. So I either need to drive or I need to somebody drive me. And that's a context that will help in us later to incentivize the action if we understand that. Okay, so let's go next. Now to understand what is the, the rotation curve, right? And this is when things start to get in interesting. If we, if we are able to identify why people is using us, right? And how often we believe that people should be using us. So then we can start to understand how many customers we're supposed to have or how many customers we are targeting to have 
in regular basis. And that's what is the retention curve. A retention is not a metric that we can influence directly. Retention is a metric that we will influence indirectly. And what I'm saying that is, you take, for example, retention, and there will be the result, although all the effort that you guys have acquiring customers, engaging customers, and resurrected customers. Let's put an example to, to make this more visible. In this graphic, I'm plotting three different products, product A, product B, product C. And here we are tracking, right? According to, let's put it in this case, we are a music application and we are tracking how often people really listen at least three minutes of music. And let's say that the products are exactly the same. Now, in this case, we are tracking people who listen music more than three minutes, right? Over the time. And this is over the months in this case, two months, four months, six months. And what we see here in this curve is the number of people in the same period of time, right? The same cohort, how they are continuing using the product. And we see the product A, they have a, a decrease of almost 95 points in the first month. And we see another product, right? Like we is behaving very good over the first four months, but over the month six, we have a terrible decrease. We have the product B who actually, they have a massive, massive loss, right? Almost more than 70 points, right? And after the recover and they get, they got a pattern of 20 points. Now, this is a real case scenario where we see people who invest a lot in acquisition, right? Like it's the product C and it's a hype in social networks and it's a hype in, uh, in a lot of like forums and blogs and later on people don't find value and leave the product. And we have a lot of products like that in the market because now it's easier to create products and to write to people, right? We have lack of retention and the product is destined to die. The same thing we have first in the product A. The product A, people using us, they don't see the value in the product. They don't see how to integrate it in the life and they just drop it. And we see, for example, the product B, like in the beginning, the product team could be concerned, but this is totally natural. And we see how this 20% of customers they continue using a period of time. So it means this 20% of people, they use in the product. In this example, the product actually is, we can help to increase their success is the product B. And for see that, I, I want to actually dig dive more a little bit, like how you will see the numbers for these people. So let's take product A, and this is how a, a, a retention analysis will look like. In the top, we have retention by month. And in the, in the bottom, you will see the unique customers who are performing the value chain interaction, right, over the time. And for the multiple these examples, let's suppose that our marketing team is amazing and they are bringing us 1,000 customers new per month. They are actually performing this interaction. So I, I'm talking about these people, they do all the work to bring these new customers and at least they listen five minutes of music in the first month, right? Now, I will see here our retention rate dies terrible in the first three months, right? And after that, it becomes zero. But if we just count the customers would I actually understand this pattern, probably we get tricked. Probably in our sales reports, we are putting this that we actually have an increase of customers. First month, amazing, 1,000. Second month, amazing, 1,050. And we go all the way to 1,080 and we establish it. So if we only look at these numbers and report these numbers to our board or to our CEO, everything looks great. We, we need to continue investing in more customers. Yeah, it's a curve. We are a startup. We need to bring more, 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 and after people will get us. Nope, that's the, the grown approach. I will say, if we don't solve the retention problem, the, the leakage, they will end up killing. Because as mentioned, it's, no, it's nothing more dangerous than actually lose customers. The cost per acquisition is terrible. Now, how we know that we are going to, to a good path? Well. If we want to see the 14,000 foot, right? We can actually graphic or retention curves. And if we see at the clip all the way in the first three months or depending on frequency, this is something that we are going bad. We need to correct it as soon as possible. But if you guys are in the okay or in the good area, 
you are okay. You just need some improvement, some optimization, but you do a good, in a good job, right? It's very difficult to arrive to something like the grade. Now, coming back again, remember, retention is not something that you can incentivize directly. So that means you can now ask your teams, guys, we have a problem in retention. Let's figure out how to solve retention right away. No, retention is a result. So meaning, doesn't matter how many emails you send, doesn't matter how many notifications you send, and doesn't matter how many other tricks you are doing to bring people, if they don't find value and they, you're not helping this customer to resolve why they're coming from to get, right? That's why depending on your acquisition and engagement, right? They will go and button up in the retention. And that's the, the difficult part. We, we are getting in this world where the activ activity or active customers is, is a word that we're using very lightly and should we not. An active customer is not somebody who logging in your application. An active customer is not somebody who just enter and click in the buttons. An active customer for Spotify is not somebody who click in the play. It's somebody who is really receiving the value, right? So how we understand this in a, in a deeper level? When we think about the life cycle of activity that a person need to, need to do for really use our product, we can categorize it in four areas. Awareness, when people get to know about a product. Consideration, when people is deciding it really use it or try to understand how to use our product. And value exchange, when this activity already happens. And as I mentioned in this conversation, awareness and consideration could happen even in the person already sign in. What does that mean for you guys? That today the battle is not just bringing people to sign into your website or to your product. Doesn't matter. There could be 20, 30,000 sign in. You can spend a bunch of money, $1 million, $2 million in campaigns. What really matters is, are you really helping these people to finish the activity? Are you delivering the value and confirming that you're delivering the value? Do you guys are detecting the context of what person was trying to trigger the value? And you guys are incentivating that? Yes or not, right? And we actually can track that. So what I mean for, for example, tools like business to business, when we get ambition, right? Doesn't matter how much effort we do for signing in vision, put all the product team in vision. If nobody's creating a mock-up and share it with somebody else and that person interact with the mock-up, right? And share it with other people, doesn't matter. Because what is the, ultimately, what is the value that I'm getting for vision as a tool, a prototype a tool? Share the knowledge with other people, right? See the mock-up, see the interaction, right? My developers understand what the interaction is and can code with that. My executive team understand what is the prototype. The same thing happens with products like in e-commerce. It's not only when the people finish the transaction, it's how many times people come to your website and didn't find the item that they're looking for, how many times they search it, and after they actually you facilitate the search and they get it. This is why a lot of e-commerce are obsessed with time to book. How many times people come search and book and they finish the transaction in the first time that they search, or they finish the transaction over the 20 times the second. How many considerations do the person have before they actually get what they want, right? Now, to see your retention rates, right? The thing that you guys will do, and this is my suggestion, is you will go, guys, once that you detected this value exchange interaction, and you guys will query the last 28 days of your database with this specific action. And you will create a histogram of customers. In this level, we'll have the number of customers and this level, the active days that that customer did that, that event. And then you guys see that the majority of your customers, right, are executing the value chain interaction in this quadrant. This means that your people is using you daily. And so on, if you guys are in the middle, this means it's weekly. And if not, they will go to the left and this means that it's monthly. Now, what is this important? Because probably you guys got a different hypothesis. Seeing the competitors or seeing the indirect competitors, you will see that people is using this kind of products like every week. And probably you will see that your product is in the monthly use case. So you guys have rooms for optimization. If you see that your competitors or your indirect competitor is uh, using in weekly and you see that your customers are in daily, so you guys need to take a look to see if something is going well. Why people is using it in this way? Are we changing behavior? Is that error in instrumentation? Is something that somebody is attacking us? 
like we need to actually be concerned and re review it. It's not, not everything is happiness. These metrics will reveal in us how many people actually they are constantly using our product and what is the real frequency. And with that, guys, we can create a retention curve and see where we are. Now, is that enough to, to understand how will I write to our business goals? No, we also need to understand what is the, what in the part of the product life cycle are we, right? What does that mean? As mentioned in the beginning, I probably have two responsibilities, value and profit. And these two things over the time, right? In a market, we can see as more customers we retain, right? Constantly over the time, we actually will increase our revenue. And the moment that we increase our revenue, and remember that profit is equals to revenue minus costs, we have a possibility to increase our margins, right? And the pro life cycle, and this is not something that I invented, this is something that I've been in business for years. We can divide it in six areas. One is trying to enter into the market, right? Which is a proof of concept and introduction. And let it over the time, trying to go to adoption, grow, maturity, and sunsetting, right? In a nutshell, what does that mean? That means like in the beginning, we have a, the proof of concept is something that we are launching with our partners, right? or people who we think is a better customer to understand how fast are we delivering value. And over the time, as we actually introduce this to the market and we start to get in market share, right? We'll actually pass from an introduction to an adoption part. What is the difference with introduction and adoption? Introduction is when we are developing the market. We are trying to take one part of the market share in the market. And when we consider adoption is when we get one part of the market, right? but we still have room to take over our competitors or over the alternatives. When we're talking about grow is when we talk about two things, we scale or we expand. We scale means we are bringing more customer or that specific market. Or we expand is we are considering to go to another geography to take over that specific market site. The other two, maturity and sunsetting, is when we are already positioning a market, when we are already five more years in a specific market, right? And we are one of the part of dominant series. That normally happens in big companies. And when you take the decision, it will keep that maturity, right? Or we will sunset it and we'll introduce it to a new product. We can see this in different kinds of products, like big company products, where we still having a MS2 or COBOL systems or like console systems that they are not necessarily to, to retire or sunset. Why? Because we don't, they don't have competitors. It could be because of regulations, they could be because of the area, but they don't have competitors, so no necessity. Sometimes a, a way to push up over the sun setting could be because pressure of the competitors, or could be because we are pursuing a better offering. One example that I love it about this point, mature sun setting, is for example, Google Music. Google Music that was there for around more than uh, 10 years, if I'm, if I'm correct, right? Soon set to leave the way open to the new product of Google that was YouTube Music, right? So the, the interesting part of the product manager is doing there is take all these customers who were using Google Music and trying to soon set the product so Google YouTube Music take over the customers and continue helping them to continue right into the valley. Now, what is important to understand the product life cycle? Because as we actually grow in, in the specific market, we'll have a bunch of things that we wanted to measure over a value chain, right? But not everything is, is important, right? When I say not everything is important, is, is everything is important or everything is urgent, nothing is important, nothing is urgent. So here, I actually try to, to put, guys, a heat map where I put my recommendations of what metrics I suggest, guys, that you should focus over the pro life cycle. You will see, I emphasize that in the beginning of the product, we hyper-focus in activity, in activation, which is how we deliver the value as soon as possible. This can be translated in onboarding, how we fast track the onboarding, how we help people to arrive to the value for first time, and engagement, how many times or how often we can deliver the value, right? And you see that metric, we always keep an eye in retention. Doesn't mean that acquisition and monetization are not important. They are important. The city light is something that we need to keep an eye. But because we know that we are developing the market, the most important is to have a customer base. Later we that, we will see that in adoption and growth, I suggest you guys to focus more in monetization, to explore 
multiple ways to monetize or multiple ways to decrease in costs. And you will ask me, hey, Jesus, why in growth you have everything right? Well, normally when, when a company is in growth or a team is in growth, we have people or teams by metric. With these people will continually optimizing each metrics and need to talk together. So there will be teams just focus on acquisition, team focusing in activation, team just focus in monetization, right? And these things are interrelated. So this team will be constantly optimizing, right? And trying to go in parallel. Now, when you are normally in the proof concept introduction and option, this normally will be a squads or teams who will have limited resources and we need to focus their attention. This is why you, you can read a heat map in that order. With all of this, how we communicate this to our teams? Coming back again to, to the beginning. Well, if you remember in the beginning, I was talking about what is a business plan, right? And the principal parts of a business plan. So we need to communicate over this period of time, what is product performance? And you can answer very simple and communicate to your team. How are we deliver value to our customers? What is product health? What is actually we need to understand if the product is available and operational for our teams. The last part, product finances is not fighting. We also need to understand how much money are we burning? How much money are we spending to make this happen over the life cycle of the product? And if you are a company who is already established, right? And you have a family of product, you also need to ask yourself how we are actually affecting. Are we are making a positive impact or a negative impact in our environment? And what that means is you actually launch a product and you have a family there and the family of products need to be sure like, are we cannibalizing this for good or you cannibalizing this for bad, right? Sometimes cannibalization is no bad. I mean, we'll just stay in the same strategic intent, right? And with that, how we look at this, if we, if we take this concept and we put this in a very simple slide for our team. So we look something like this. We need to, every quarter, we need to have very clear what we are measuring, right? What is our strategic intent? And we are going to this market to what? To develop. Are we into this market to what? To penetrate, to defend, to expand. Based on that, right? What is the principal metric that we are targeting, right? For the product. And we are targeting acquisition, activation, engagement. And what is the counter reaction metric that we are looking for, right? Are we actually, we are focusing activation, but in the same time, we don't want the monetization goes so, so low. We focus in acquisition, but in the same time, we don't want to actually affect engagement, right? And with that, you actually can report how many times are you receiving the value, normally retention, right? How much of this retention is generated in finances and the product health you can measure your funnels or other ways that you actually measure the products available for the customers and report which areas are impacted. Now, this later on, right? When you communicate this in OKRs or in scorecards, remember OKRs and scorecards need to follow a structure. We have a mission, we have financial, we have the strategy, and we have the tactics. What I'm showing you here, guys, is how you can communicate like we are doing this for our customers, right? And we are delivering this value but we are tying this to our business goals. And after that, every single part of the tactics, the initiative that you have in your OKRs or your scorecards, that will contribute to this top level, okay? So with this, what about an example? And something that you guys can remember, right? And this is the last part of, the, of the, this presentation. If I, if I can give you something that you can use before every meeting or you have 10 minutes in your products, right? Think about two things every time that you're thinking product performance. What is that, that thing that my customer is trying to get? What is the value? I normally see the product mission. Identify what is the value and what is the action in my product who is generating the value. From the business goal standpoint, where I am in the market, what is my product? How my product is behaving right now in the Mexican market, in the Colombian market, in the American market? Every market is different. We have different market shares. So where I am, you need to identify what is the product lifecycle stage. And with that, you guys will arrive to something like this, right? In this example, let's say that the strategic intent where is Spotify and we are entering in United States. And United States already have Pandora and they have other like Pandora, I do, yeah, for example, MTV. So all the strategic intent we are trying to end is increase adoption in the United States. So what is actually our segment? Let's think specifically about the people who listen to music with a free account. 
remember, what is the business model of Spotify? Now, what is the action that is delivering the value? As we talk, listen music. We need to measure how people listen music and how people is doing with alternatives. Who they are using just in daily basis. They listen radio or listen Pandora on daily basis. Now, thinking in our financial aspect, we are making money by this free by ads. So we need to measure how long time people is listening ads. But we need to first put it, what is the value? So people is receiving the value for the amount of time that people is listening music. So here we have all performance. Here we have all financials, right? And below, we need to understand like, okay, so what is our business goal? If we are entering into the market, right? So we are actually increasing adoption. What does it mean increasing adoption? Well, increasing adoption means how we fast track the value for the customers. So this means people who will use Spotify, how we help them to onboard as fast as possible to listen songs. And these songs, they spend the longer time possible to listen more songs that they like and they include in their life. So we need to reduce the time of activation, right? And this is a very simple framework that later, guys, you can communicate with your team in a more sophisticated way, like this other slide that I put it here. With that, guys, in mind, you have all the tools necessary to start to calculate in retention curves and understand if you are doing good or bad to retain the customers and to achieve your business goals. And with that, uh, I would like to finish the the presentation and open for questions. Thank you so much for, for your time, guys, and thank you for staying with me. If there is a specific format for the questions or uh, everyone can just talk. That's a very good question. So let's Let's, let's go to Christy, how, how do you want to, to organize that? I mean, if, if, if you don't mind, they can open the mic and ask a question or either just text yeah. in, the, in the chat, whatever it works for you. I want to go me. first then. <laughs> so it's a good, good presentation, by the way, thanks. Yeah, really great information. So my question is is about in a real scenario or with re real company. I assume that you worked on some uh, companies where you were working with uh, different product managers. So do you have any uh, memory or some example when a, me a specific measure changed the way that you were prioritization some some feature a specific feature or do you just remove an uh, hypothesis and decide to do x or y thing just just by a single measuring that is the daily life of a of a product team if a product team is no in no understanding what is success so they are doing something wrong in all my career the principal thing that we have is how we actually know that we are taking over that market and how many customers are we retaining. And we are watching the dashboards obsessively day by day. And we need to understand how we are actually taking decisions and everything else, all the initiatives, all the roadmaps and prioritizing that. And in companies I work, for example, small companies, like the, I will be 20, 30 people, right? I will be the person who will talk with the engineer manager and the UX manager to make this happen. When companies like, as a size of PayPal, I, in daily basis, I need to talk with analytical people, with product managers, with directors of uh, in the case marketing or business to take this kind of decisions. So I can tell you anything that we do in a company should be moved if we don't understand the behind what or which number is moving it. I don't know if you want to scope more your question, like specifically because uh, everything that we do is, is basically based on on a metric is if we are launching a new experiment, if we are launching a new application, if we are changing even the design or the colors of the design, we do that because we believe, right? We have a, a prediction that will increase the market share by a certain amount. Yeah. No, thanks. Great. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure.
Any other question, guys? I don't bite. I swear. Somebody asked me if you can find me in Twitter. Unfortunately, not. Uh, I mean, I am in Twitter, like uh, at Cajido, like my last name, but I don't use Twitter. But you can guys find me in LinkedIn. Uh, Hello there. Yes, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. What readings do you recommend to expand your knowledge on this topic? Or measuring success? Specifically? Well, to measure yeah, success. Yeah, about. Uh -huh. Yeah. To measure success specifically, I can recommend some business books. Um, I can I can share a list of books that definitely no I won't recommend some product books because majority of the product books I read they are more focused in the discovery size and the execution. Unfortunately, until today, a lot of books are just focused in execution or, or help you to create MVPs. But to really yeah. understand what is product success, we need to come back to the basis to understand the business, right? Like books like Profit from the Core or actually it's a book called like How to Measure Success. All these books actually focus in how we create a business and how we grow the business. Probably the ones I, I recommend the most is a very simple lecture. It's called it The Grid, literally, The Grid. And it's a, it's a very simple and digestible business book which explore what is a business model without entering the, in the business model campus, exploring really what is competition, what is profit, how we need to bring customers, right? And it's a very simple lecture that you guys can, can read like easily. Uh, I forget the name, the author, but let me just, just share my screen. Oh yeah. Here we go. Matt Watkinson. Yeah. The Grid by Matt Watkinson, I think is, is a very simple and digestible book. Uh, there are other books very interesting, like Unlocking the Value Change. It's also another interesting book to read our product and success to understand how companies, how we can measure what is, how to bond it and unbond it, the value chain to accelerate value for our customers. Mm. And I, I don't think that we need to go so, so far away. Remember everything that we have, like digital product management, right? Is, is something that is getting mature, but they are already product managers, physical product managers. Yeah, they are creating cars and physical goods who improve this process, mm -hmm. right? So we have taken, like always, we are taking and borrowing concepts for other areas to try to polish in digital products. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's another one, very good profit. The profit from the core, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Somebody asked Claudio Rivas say, how this align to a customer success strategy? Could you elaborate more? It's actually one of my favorite topics this. What do you mean, what do you mean with customer success strategy? No, okay. Meanwhile, Claudio want to explain what is for him customer success strategy. It's, it's, it's a typical example. We enter in a big company and everybody have his own goals. They want to remember like, we only have one market, right? Think about this, like people is, right now is we have number of people by country. In the United States, we have 300 million people, right? From these 300 million people, not everybody will use a product. So we need to understand what is the total addressable market and what is the service level addressable market. Based on that, we have a possible customers that we can interact with. Right? With that, we need to figure out how we'll bring the value to them, right? What it means value for them and how we can integrate in their life. 
And it's normal that people already have products and they resist. We can afford people, like we can afford behaviors like you already are paying your bills using the, the same thing that your father did and did it for 20 years. We can afford you to pay every single day or like just slap you and say, Psh, no, this is your product. So we need to figure out how we help them to use our product. And this only could be in two ways. We need to show that our product, right? Digital or physical is faster and accurate to help them to receive the value. That's the way that we introduce it. Now, everything around there, right? We can call it business strategy, right? You can call it success strategy, customer success strategy, product strategy, everything around it is through that goal, right? How we take the market and how we help people to arrive to the value. Hey, Jesus. Um, well, I, I believe that during your presentation, which was great, you mainly focus on business to B2C products, right? Well, I, I talk about business to business products too, uh, like yeah. Ambition and Mixed Panel. Yeah, and what about creating value for, for, for the B2B products? I mean, <clears throat> if trying to expand a, a, new, a new software uh, that we are developing for B2B, but uh, well, we are in the process of defining the branding, etc. So, any tips you can provide to increase value for customers? And of course, of course, Pablo. So, that and it's an excellent question. That normally, normally people think in these two things: business to customer and business to business as a two different things. The reality is, like at the end, is people, right? So in business to customer, we are helping people to do activities in their life, these people. When we are talking about business to business, we are helping people to do their jobs, right? And here, when we talk about, about business to business, it's pretty interesting because we have three kinds of segments that you guys need to recognize. One is who is the executor, who is the beneficial, the people who is benefiting, and who is paying for this. That normally happens in a in a business to business scenario. So when I'm talking about like let's say a business to business product, Google Docs is a business to business product. Mixpanel is a business to business product. Uh, Salesforce is a business to business product. The people who ex executing the job could be different to the people who benefit from the job, and could be different for the people who is paying for that. The CFO, for example, is paying for that, or the executives is paying for the product, right? But the people who is beneficial, let's put an example of um, Invision again, right? Invision is this tool to have, you guys know Invision? By the way, I'm talking to all, all the class about that. I don't know if you guys know. You guys have Invision? I don't. No worry. No worry. I will show you what is Invision. Sure. So Invision is a prototyping tool, right? But let's put another example. Like, do you know Salesforce? Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Okay, so let's put it with Salesforce. So the people who is paying, right, is the executive, right? Who is the people who is actually doing the job for Salesforce? So the sales representative, right? The people who is writing all the reports and all the calls. Who are the people who benefit for Salesforce? So everybody put in there, right? So there could be the executives and even the sales managers, they benefited because they will see all the power of Salesforce is try to concentrate all the details and the pipelines. And in the case that the sales representative leave the company, so the information is there. What happened before Salesforce? Every sales representative have his contact list. And when that person leave, we leave all the, all the deals, right? We, we forget about the deals. But with Salesforce, we have everything centralized. So we need to understand who is paying, who is executing, and who is benefiting for that, right? And then all there are people. And we need to convey our message. When you guys are creating presentation of decks for this, for the executive, we need to teach them how much will be the value will be monetary. With Salesforce, you will save millions of dollars of loss of opportunity because you sell representative leaving the company. To the sell representative, why are you helping? You are doing his job. So he probably get promoted. You can work faster in Salesforce instead to have thousands of books to put in an address. Salesforce do the automatic calculations for you, right? And for the manager, like, oh, Salesforce is automatically aggregating and you will see the reports in one line, saving time. 
and what the Salesforce overall is helping to make money to the company. Did that clarify your, your question, uh, Paulo? Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. That is my pleasure. Any, any other questions? Jesus, I think there's a question in the chat uh, from Alberto Vasquez. Alberto, Alberto say, if every problem will eventually be sunset, how do you keep the company profitable? Is PayPal preparing the ground to, to sunset products? Okay, so PayPal already sunset a lot of products. <laughs> That's the important thing to sunset products. Like the customer will continue adopting products. Spotify probably already is like sunset a lot of products. Google already sunset a lot of products. What is actually what we do as a company, right? So we create products and we ensure that a new product will take the place of the old product. So for example, how many times have you guys are changing Outlook? You guys are using Outlook, by the way? Yep. Probably Outlook has been sunset in the old versions of Outlook and remake it Outlook and the next version of Outlook many, many times. But you can tell me, Jesus, that's the same product. Not necessarily. Outlook in the beginning was very strictly use Outlook as an application who receive emails. But with the time Outlook is right now like operating system where you can receive your task, you can see the calls, when you can actually have a, even Cortana there, right? So one example of this, I, one of my favorites is I don't know if you guys ever use this application called a Wonderlist. Wonderlist was an application, you know, a very famous application acquired by Microsoft. And while actually Wonderlist was in the top of the GTD time, they, when Microsoft acquired it, they took them around three years to sunset. And why they took in three years to sunset? Because you cannot just switch off the product. You never sunset a product switching off. You always will create a new product that will replace them. So when Wonderlist was sunset and took three years, what the Wonderlist team was doing is integrating Wonderlist in to-do list in Microsoft. And they were trying to move all these customers that were using Wonderlist to the to-do list of Microsoft to rescue all the customers to a new product. So you see what is happening here? We just not, not shooting down products right away. We take all these customers and we're trying to put it in another product. Sometimes when we sunset products, we also need to offer alternatives, right? Like, I don't know if you guys remember this application that's super famous, uh, Mailbox. You guys remember Mailbox? No. My Dropbox was super Mailbox app. Mailbox was an application by Dropbox and it was super famous and exploded. It was his own email application. When the company was growing, they noticed that that Dropbox that was getting away for the principal mission and they need to cut the cost, right? Remember the, the diagram of the profit? Sometimes we take decisions to, to sunset products because we cannot longer spend money in them. So Mailbox, right, was sunsetting soon soon into focus Evernote, right? In what actually, sorry, Dropbox, in what they were really wanted to do, which was like creating a platform that helped people to collaborate better. And Mailbox was no part of that. So what they did at this setting took around two years and a half to sunset, but they offered to the customers to keep their application and keep the information offline for, for a certain period of time. Meanwhile, the customers choose a new tool and they get to, again, another tool like Gmail or in this case, Hotmail to continue doing the same activity. Did that uh, answer your question, uh, Alberto? It was great. Thanks. It is my pleasure. Great. Yes, I think we are on time. Um, <laughs> I can talk about Prolog all day. So thank you so much for, for yes. your time, guys. I talked about Paro. I think it was a great talk. Um, we will share with you the feedback. So please. 
Okay, if you attend this meeting, help us with your feedback. It's really valuable for Jesus and for Academy. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.